The morning star drive on 17.8. You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride, and it's time to fly. So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind. Hey guys, how is it going? And welcome to the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. It is Tuesday, May 14th, and so happy for you joining us. We are ready to start another day together with the Lord. So subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on SoundCloud, and make sure to support us on Patreon. So today we have an exciting podcast for you. We have Pravi in the media, the practical word study, and of course, commentaries, updates, and news on what is happening around the world world in this history today. All right, everyone, how are you doing? I hope you guys had an amazing and awesome Monday. Yes, it is already Tuesday, getting into the meat of the week. Hope you guys have enjoyed this week thus far, putting this week's word into action, doing it together with the Holy Trinity, with Jesus and the Lord. All right, so uh, Q&A Thursday, already a bunch of questions coming in. There are actually... Uh, more questions than I expected, but keep sending them in because I can answer some of them during uh, during the week, during section one, like I'm going to do today. Uh, if you haven't yet, uh, leave a like and comment to build our community. Yes, every single day we have amazing, uh, just these great people going out there commenting not only on this channel, but the Rebel Pastor channel. And uh, it's really good because it just builds this community together. Um, yeah, so everyone, just very, very happy for everyone joining us every weekday on the Morning Star Drive. So let's get up and support each other each and every day. This week's Sunday message titles, the first one, the person who has the best life of faith. And last but not least, we have Behold, it is a new thing. It is a new heaven and a new earth. So everyone, uh, how was your Monday? Kind of leave in the comments if there's anything exciting or anything you did yesterday. For myself, uh, I was like pretty... Like my body was pretty beaten from the volleyball tournament. So I, you know, even after getting the massage, I can't imagine what my muscles would be like uh, if I didn't get a massage either. But uh, my legs are recovering really, really well at this time. Uh, and hmm, anything else happened? Oh, you know what? I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about that first title for the Sunday messages, the person who has the best life of faith. And if you guys really think about it, if you look at the definition that Sunseam gave uh, or the message gave on uh, on uh, the Sunday message, it's like uh, number one was being in the new time period, like knowing what God's will is in this time period, right? So knowing the new time period, uh, believe that Jesus came back again, right? We know that Jesus is coming back, the second coming. And then it's like believing in the one that he sent and following him, right? So the thing is, when you think about the definition of the best life of faith, We've heard this before. And when would the, when was this emphasized before? Well, it was emphasized during the rapture. Remember we had like the, the 100 line, 300 line, 700 line, 1,000 line, this type of thing, right? And the interesting thing is when you read it, you're like, wait, that's the exact same thing because the rapture is the fulfillment of the purpose of creation. And that's basically what the definition is for the purpose of creation, right? To become the counterpart of love to God. How? Number one, you have to be in the new time period. Well, how do I get in the new time period? Number one, I got to believe in Jesus. Jesus' spirit came back a second time. And the second thing I have to recognize is it's through the person that God has sent. So we're going to hear the words, put them into action. We're following this person. And that is like the basics, the very, very basics of fulfilling the purpose of creation. So... When I was thinking about this, I was like, yeah, you know, we've talked about this before. And, you know, we did such an, ex you know, I, I wasn't, um, I didn't actually start uh, this podcast during uh, the rapture, during that time. That, you know, I thought to myself, wouldn't that be so awesome if someone was doing, or this podcast started like before the rapture? Because I think that would have been epic. It would have been so epic to have this podcast going day by day during the 1 a.m. prayer time, you know, during the time that we were like, uh, we had the Holy Spirit movements. That would be wild if we had a podcast at that time. We could look back, you know, historically speaking too, people would know what is going on in this history by listening to the podcast five times a week, the historians would be like, oh, this is what was happening in Providence at that time there too. So, man, I almost wish, oh, at that time I was head leading. So, and I was at the, the Lord's Church uh, for the five years before that. But uh, that would have been crazy if we had that. Of course, we do have, you know, historical records of what happened. But the podcast is coming from like uh, the followers the followers' perspective, right? So I think 
that would have been quite amazing if we were able to have the podcast going on at that time. Yeah, that would that, that'd be pretty crazy. Uh, you know, uh, currently we are also in the, uh, uh, the 70 prayer condition. And for the 70 day prayer condition, uh, I think as we're pushing into the 70 day prayer condition, we're hearing a lot of things happening during this time. And I think the more that we hear about these things that are going on, it makes us really realize and understand how important this prayer condition really is. Like, for instance, remember we heard the, the beginning of the 70-day prayer or the beginning of the three-day fast that we had before the 70-day prayer, uh, this nuclear bomb uh, prayer condition started, uh, was that Sunseep did five days of fasting even without water. And that the result of that five days of fasting resulted in two of the girls being released from prison, right? So that's like pretty wild. And that would be, that would be enough reason for Sunstein to say, okay, if that's going to happen with five days of, uh, uh, of fasting and that's just him by himself, imagine if all of Providence fasted three days together and then we began the 70-day uh, nuclear bomb prayer condition, right? Uh, another thing we heard in last week's probably in the media, and this is just what we heard from uh, that... It was in the news. It was also on a television program where the, the producer and also KDH went on. Producer actually said that uh, because of the copying of the files, right, which is allowed by the, the courts, um, they said that Maple totally doesn't want this to happen to the point uh, she may even drop the lawsuit. And if you drop the lawsuit, then basically Sun seems going to be innocent. He'll be let free, right? So there's another thing that we look at. It's like, oh, that's interesting too. Uh, another thing is, uh, I think, uh, looking at all the signs, looking at the signs around the world. Like, you know, I was just in an earthquake uh, a couple days ago. And we see all these things happening around the world. And I think that's something, that's another sign that God is kind of speaking to us and saying, this is what is going on, right? And I would say last but not least is this week's message. During this 70-day prayer condition, what is the new direction we received? And it's not like we, it's a major shift in evangelism. And you can see that the established uh, the established faith, the former faith has gone too far, too fixed in their perspective where there's like an official shift. May 12th, 2024 is like the official shift of uh, evangelism, not going to the former faith of those that are waiting for the Lord's second coming, but it's going towards the Gentiles and the second gen Christians, right? And, you know, it's the, the message is telling us we have to Check and see, are they Gentiles or not? Or are they not established uh, former faith? Established meaning having that fixed perspective, right? So when I saw that, I was like, wow, this is so interesting. It really is. So I, you know, I, I already talked to, I mean, uh, just, just looking at those like different things that are happening, I think that we can realize more and more these are signs telling us that there is this, uh, that this nuclear bomb prayer condition is going to be a very, very big condition that uh, we should all be taking even more seriously the three times a day, the four, one, and the seven, stuff like that too. So when I looked at that, I was like, oh, that's really, really interesting just to see some of the signs. Um, oh, uh, I was telling you guys yesterday that, uh, you know, I was kind of like announcing it on the podcast. I was like, hey guys, you know, because... There's a lot of Japanese members that listen to this podcast too. And that's why I was kind of joking around and saying, uh, I was telling, I was saying that, hey, let me know when you have the next uh, volleyball tournament in Japan. I'd love to go visit. And in all honesty, uh, I've already asked. <laughs> I've already asked. I, I, already, I already know when their event is. But I was just, you know, I was kind of just bringing this up like, oh, I want to go visit the other volleyball tournaments. Uh, I would say that, uh, yeah, it's interesting because the next volleyball tournament in Korea, Taiwan, and Japan, they are all in the same month. They're all in November. And I was like, wow, it's possible in a month I could go to three volleyball tournaments. And I'm like, whoa, that'd be kind of crazy. But I definitely, definitely want to, um, cause I, you know, I've been to the Taiwan, Taiwan, and I really experienced it. And I would have to say, 
uh, so far from the one from comparing to the Korean one. This might sound really weird, uh, but it was a much more. Uh, I'm not going to say spiritual because there's a lot of spiritual conditions that were set during the, the, the Korean volleyball tournament too. I would say it's a, it's a more organized, yeah, it's more organized event. It's more organized spiritual event. So conditions were set. Even in Taiwan, same, they, they did the 21-day prayer condition for their uh, volleyball tournament. Uh, but I would say it's more spiritually organized. Like I would love to see this happen in Malaysia. But of course, Malaysia is much smaller. It's like seven. It's like less than seven hundred people compared to Taiwan is almost five thousand, right? So when you look at those, the two differences, it's not like you can have a tournament of like ten, not even ten teams. But I would, I think it would be great if we had a tournament. Oh, actually, I know in June there's going to be a tournament happening, and there's going to be uh, like what do you call it? A play day between Singapore and Malaysia. So that would be pretty fun to watch, also. So I'm definitely looking forward to that too. I'm not sure if I can actually make it or not. Well, I'll try my best to make it, but I would love to go visit there, visit Singapore too, because uh, Singapore, uh, the church there is awesome. I love all the members there, and I, I haven't seen them in such a long time. Uh, but when, when I look at the, the different tournaments, personally, my feeling is, is that uh, I can't wait to see the Japanese one because the Japanese members are like super super detailed organized. I want to see what that event looks like. I think that would be kind of cool to watch also. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Maybe this could be uh, even a future mission. And if it comes to volleyball, if you really think about it, there's not many volleyball nations in the world. I think there's only four, to be honest. I think there's only four. I think it's Malaysia, Taiwan, Japan, and Korea. And uh I would definitely say that probably the overall, like overall level of volleyball, Japan is probably the best. I would say overall level. Uh, whenever I go to Japan play volleyball, both guys and girls, they're all good. They all have the basics. And then maybe after that, it would probably be tied between... I would say it'd probably be tied between Malaysia and Taiwan in a close second. And then I would probably say Korea. Remember, we're talking overall. If we're talking best team, like if all the best teams from each of the countries came, I think Korea would definitely have the best team. I, I, that's, I'm pretty sure about that one. They'd have the best team. But yeah, uh, I've already asked. So I know someone was saying like, hey, just go and talk to them. I'm like, you know, I'm, an, I'm a super extrovert. I've already talked to these people. I know all the heads of volleyball for like the four different countries and stuff. So talking and discussing with them, uh, yeah, it's, it's already been talked to. So yeah, you know, that's me. Super, super extrovert. MBTI is 93% extrovert. So I am so far out in the extroversion world or whatever you want to call that. Yeah. But uh, interesting. Uh, so I, I, I got a good question, right? And this is a good question um, uh, from America. And someone was asking me because I've been working on social media or I've been working on internet ministry for years now, right? So I've been working on it for years. And the question that came about, like someone asked me this question, I think is important for all of us who are doing social, who are going to start to do internet ministry and stuff. They said, um, the question is, uh, since more people are starting to focus on online ministry, could you share what your process is to create your own deadlines and stick to them? I love workflows and processes and curious to hear the behind the scenes of how you prepare and stay consistent. So the workflow, this, this is a very interesting thing because uh, this is basically like my job. So I am doing this full time. This is full time for me. I'm doing the two different channels. Uh, I do the Morning Star Drive, which is obviously five times a week. It's uh, pre recorded the day before, Sunday through Thursday. And I always get my content recorded and done by uh, 2 p.m. That's like, that's my deadline. My deadline is always 2 p.m. every day. So uh, I, I basically, in the morning, well, when, I, when I'm on my super regular schedule, usually, I will go to the gym early. Uh, you know, you, you wake up, you do your pre-dawn. I go to the gym, usually around 7, 7.30 a.m. I get back, shower, do all that other different stuff, and then I work on my content, okay? So this is kind of just like the basic schedule. I'll probably spend about an hour to two hours, um, about, maybe about, a, yeah, about an hour and a half on my, uh, my, not my script, but like content I want to talk about. Like even right now, 
I'm walking around the house, right? So I don't really have like a big script. I just have key points that I know need, I know I need to talk about, right? So I, I I work on that script to see. Oh, these are some of the cool things that I want to talk about today. Okay, and I do work on that for about an hour and a half because I have the three segments per day. And then after that, uh, I will do my recording and the recording takes roughly an hour and then another extra maybe 15, 20 minutes just to edit and upload. All right, so that's going to be my schedule. It's roughly about three hours around that time. But um, when I do this uh, to stay on, well, it's very interesting because uh, because I'm pre-recording, it doesn't go up until the next day. So if there is uh, some type of, uh, what do you call it, a crashing of schedules or a conflict in my schedule, I actually will, uh, I will, I can change it from the morning to the evening and I'll do it before I sleep. But I prefer not to do that because by the end of the day, just exhausted, right? Like so exhausted. And you know, when you're exhausted, you're not really in your right mindset. And when you're exhausted, it's, you know, it's like you, you don't want to do it, right? Uh, but it really depends on my schedule. So uh, uh, the bigger question actually that people ask me is, is where do I get my content for five times a week? Plus I'm doing the, the live stream for the, for the Rebel Pastor channel, right? So for me, uh, the content I have comes from everywhere, because it's five times a week, I have to be even more aware of what's going on or like the, the, what I'm talking about or who I talk to. What does that mean? So I need a ton of content every day. So I have four main areas where I get my content, right? And especially for MSD, which is it's daily life and the word, right? So I do get content from the word, whether when I listen to the word, things I'm inspired by, right? So and I was like, oh, I want to talk about this, okay? Uh, and second one, I probably get probably the, this is where I get the most is probably conversations. I have conversations with members all the time, everywhere I go, every country, uh, or I'm on the phone and, I, and I'm talking, you know, I'll talk to Pastor Baker in Korea. I'll talk to his son, Daniel. You know, I'll talk to some people in Japan. I'll talk to some people in America and Canada. Like I'm always talking to people all the time. And the, one of the things I really find is when you, when you're having lots of conversations, I really have to be aware. Aware of what? Uh, I'm aware that everyone has some type of inspiration or everyone's going through something or everyone has something that when they share it, I'm like, whoa, that's so interesting. Like that's really, really interesting and I want to share about these things or talk about it or think about it more deeply. So my conversations with people is very big for me. It really is. It's something where I'm going, yeah, yeah, oh, I want to talk about this. So whenever I have a conversation and there's a big topic that comes up, I make sure to write it down. Like I'll be like, oh, interesting thought. And I'll just like put it in my, in my phone or in my notes and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll text it to myself. I'll be like, make sure you talk about this. So conversation is probably one of the biggest ones. The word too, uh, also experiences, Right? So I do have uh, certain experiences that I go through, and like kind of like what happened during volleyball where, where I was out of position. And then after I'll be discussing and thinking and talking to God like, oh, that's so interesting how different this really is kind of thing, right? So experience is another place that I find my content. And also some things I'll just be walking down the street. I'll be in the bathroom or wherever it is in the shower. And just a thought will like suddenly pop up in my head. And when those types of things happen too, I'll, I'll write them down and like, oh, I got to talk about this. So that's where a lot of my, this is where most of my con content comes from, right? And because of that, uh, because of uh, the format of MSD, especially sec segment number one, it's way more casual. It's a longer format. I don't need to be so exact and precise because I'm sometimes just going through thoughts together with you right? Going through mental exercises with you, right? That's why, I, that's why I can talk about nonsense things too. I can vent. I can do all these other different things. And I talk about my life, uh, things that others may relate to, and also what I struggle with and realize too. So uh, one thing that I, I found that these last four years of doing uh, MSD, it's really prepared me for what I'm doing right now for the Rebel Pastor, 
right? And that's why you're going to see a lot of overlap in content when it comes to uh, the Rebel Pastor and MSD. There's, there's going to be some overlap. And it's because the audiences are completely different. They're completely different, right? So the Rebel Pastor is more, it's free for anyone to watch and MSD is more just for members, right? So that's why when I do this, I, I am, uh, I really make sure that uh, when I do, uh, you know, eventually what's going to happen is the Rebel Pastor is not supposed to be just for members, but it's more for newcomers, right? What does that mean? It means that eventually, like even now, even now there's like 5,300 subscribers on my, uh, on my Rebel Pastor. And guess what? Probably maybe a thousand of them are going to be members, which means that only 20% are members and the rest, uh, the 80% are non-members that are listening. Right, So if that's the case, it's not like they're listening to MSD at all, right? Now, Rebel Pastor is a little bit different because Rebel Pastor is now all live streaming. So it's, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be tomorrow, right? Well, uh, for America, it's going to be Tuesday night and then Wednesday morning for the Asian countries. But since it's, it's a live stream, uh, I kind of take uh, like Joe Rogan, long form podcasting, Lex Friedman, Michael Williamson, like these, these people out there that are really, really good at podcasting. And, you know, they all have their specialties. And for me, my specialty is going to be about explanations of the word, uh, things that Sunseam's talked about in the past. So it'll, it'll help a lot of people to understand the word a lot better, right? Now, uh, how does long form pa- podcasting work? It's, it's so much easier these days because you have this really long podcast. Like you go watch a Joe Rogan podcast, guess how long it is? It's like two to three hours, okay? So you have a two to three hour podcast and what happens? During that two to three hour podcast, what they do, we, they realize that not everyone's gonna be able to listen to the entire thing, right? And because everyone cannot listen to the entire thing, what's gonna happen? Well, because they can't all listen to the entire thing, uh, they will cut up that two to three hour podcast into those like different segments like, hey, this segment is basically saved by grace and you take out that eight minute video and then you post it separately, right? So some people who don't want to listen to the entire two to three hour and they can't go around searching for that content, what they're going to do is they're going to just watch that short video instead, right? So there's one way of doing it. And another thing is, you know, people who don't want to listen to the three-hour podcast, they don't want to listen to a 10-minute video, will take even smaller clips of that live stream, and it's going to be 60 seconds. And these are the YouTube shorts. They're kind of like Instagram reels, right? And because of this, this allows people with the shorter attention span, probably the younger, younger people, to be watching it in that way. Right. So, you know, that's kind of like my format, what I go through. And uh, like the question that uh, this person asked, it's an interesting question because is uh, this person is asking about workflows and processes. Right. What do I do behind the scenes and such? What keeps me going over the last four years to do MSD five times a week? Okay. So, uh, a couple of things that I would say are re- three things I think would be really, really important. Is it three or two or three things? I would say uh, three things very, very important, okay? Uh, doing internet ministry and social media and making it work out really well, uh, it's definitely not easy and it takes time and a lot of effort, okay? So uh, just look at Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, I just talked about, it took him five years uh, before he even started to make any money. He was losing money for five years. But why, how was he able to lose money and keep doing it? And the answer is, it's because he really, really enjoyed it. It was his passion project. He did it in his garage. And I would say that's one of the very first things that you have to think about when it comes to social media. Don't do something that you don't like, right? Don't do something that's like work, Right? For me, this is work because technically I'm making money from this. However, I'm not, I'm, not like, uh, I'm not making a ton of money from it. And on top of it, it's like I am working because I'm making money from it, but it's actually even a passion project and I really enjoy what I do. Try something you really like. 
Something, because if you really like it, you can do it for a long time. It doesn't feel like it's a sacrifice. Because I see some people when, 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 when some seems like, or when the message says, all right, let's do internet ministry, the very first thing they do is they kind of do things that just to say that they're doing it. Oh, so they'll post Proverbs every day or they'll, you know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that some people just do it for the sake of doing it because they want to just show that, oh, look, God, I'm actually doing something, right? And I don't think that's a bad thing, but I know that it's not going to last very long. It just doesn't last very long, right? And because it doesn't last very long, what that means is, is you know, eventually you're going to be like, ah, oh, I've done enough of this, so let's, let me move on. You, got, you, you might last six months in that type of thing to be that consistent, right? So do something you really like. It doesn't feel like a sacrifice. For me, I love the word. I love lecturing. And that's why the rebel pastor and explaining the word is something I enjoy. Taking things, realizing from situations, realizing from my life experiences, uh, you know, talking. I just love talking in general. I love, you know, I love to be able to be able to talk to people, be honest with them, vent, rant, talk about things in Providence that most people don't want to talk about. And that's something that I enjoy. Right? And because I enjoy this type of thing, this is why it's been so easy for me to do it uh, for the last four years with never missing an episode of MSD, right? And I would say it's going to be the exact same, you know, it, this is something that you guys have to think about. What can you contribute that you really like to do? And remember, internet ministry is not just preaching the word or posting Proverbs and doing things like this. What is, uh, what is internet ministry? Remember, there's indirect where you can start um, a podcast. You can start videos, explanations on fashion or beauty or real estate or business chess. There's just so many different uh, ni like niches out there that you can just tag on to. And it's something that if you really enjoy it, you can do it for a long time, right? So I would say when it comes to something like internet ministry, and it's not going to be your 100% full-time thing, definitely do something you really like because that's going to be something that, hey, I like sharing about this, so just share it, right? The second thing I think would be very, very uh, important when it comes to you guys doing internet ministry is, uh, this is one of the things that this person commented me on is consistency, right? Consistency and just making sure that it's always up on time and stuff like that too, right? I would say be consistent. Number two is consistent. Never miss it. This is like your job. Never miss. You only get better with consistency. And you're going to notice a stark difference uh, from my first episode to my thousandth episode, right? My first episode, when I first started MSD, you know what? You guys go go back and listen to it. I'm just trying to figure out, I know the area I want to talk in. I'm going to talk about spiritual things. I'm going to talk about providence. I'm going to talk about this and that. I, I, I just started sharing testimonies. I started sharing about 30 lessons. Like these are all things that I know about. But as I got to like episode 30, 40, 50, things begin to get more fine-tuned. You realize like there are certain things you can't talk so much about. For instance, let me give an example of something that's more recent I told you guys about is in Korea, there is someone who does a YouTube and it's about 30 lessons, right? And when it's about 30 lessons, what happens is you realize there's only 30. So after you do all 30 lessons, what happens? You're done. There's, what other content do you have? So the, the person I met in Korea, they're pivoting towards like more spiritual things. They're like singing praises. They're doing that. They're you know, sharing testimonies and stuff like that too. So they're, as they're doing it, oh, excuse me one second. I hope you guys didn't hear that. I try to cover up the mic. But um, the, people are going to try, people are going to start to, uh, put themselves into an area where they realize that's the best for them, right? So even for me, like I had to, for MSD, as I'm doing it, my first 30 episodes, 50 episodes, get to 100, I'm slowly fine-tuning and getting myself into a position where it's, it's better for me, right? And I realize, oh, this is the space that I should be in. The best part about, uh, the best part about me uh, doing MSD or internet ministry is uh, there is no one else doing it. 
which means I basically have 100% of the Providence podcasting market in the English world, right? And that's, you know, that's why it's, you know, it's a little bit easier in the beginning because I have everything. But I have this audience and I can see by the views and the non-views which topics are better, which topics are worse. I'm like, oh, people really want to hear about the Sunday message word study. Oh, people want to know about um, uh, the Proverbs. People want to know about this. People want to know about that, right? So when I look at this, I'm like, ah, that makes, you know, it, it, it made it a little bit easier. Now I'm very grateful and thankful. Like we have Kiera and Erica. They're doing uh, absolute faith within. And I think it's good because one podcast shouldn't take the entire market because it is impossible to do so. What does that mean? I can only do things in my area. But Kiera and Erica, their podcast is touching a completely different area. And because they touch that area, it should... Um, attract a different group of person. I can't attract every single person, right? Unless I'm going to be so generic, right? But when you get too generic, then a lot of people don't want to listen to it anyways, right? So when I looked at that, I was like, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. And I, I, should, be, uh, I should be thinking about this. Uh, uh, with the consistency, I am narrowing down what would make my podcast more successful in Providence, right? Like uh, the last thing I'm going to tell you is this. Uh, the last thing is about time. So I want you to take a look at it in this way. Uh, there's a theory out there that says that in order to be an expert or good at something, it takes 10,000 hours. Okay, so 10,000 hours. So let's, let's just pretend that 10,000 hours is the number. So let's say that you need to do 10,000 um, hours of work on your social media to get to a really successful and good point. Okay. Well, if you do full-time, full-time, uh, full-time like in Instagram, full-time uh, social media, you're going to get to the 10,000 hours way faster than the person that does it once or twice a week, right? Because it's just about getting to a number, right? Like, yeah, there's going to be times where people, you know, hit oil. They'll strike gold because um, one of their videos does go viral and then they're like, whoa, I've already got 100,000 viewers or whatever it is, right? Yeah, I understand that. But in most cases, people don't really just hit a viral video. It takes time, right? So I would say that if you were to look at it, say, as 10,000 hours or 1,000 hours or whatever it is, the more time and effort you put into it, the faster you'll get to your destination of success, whether you want to do, like how you want to do internet ministry, right? Full-time is the shortest path to success, but it requires the most amount of sacrifice. So I'll give you an example for me is, oh, from, from my experience doing full-time uh, YouTube, one of the hardest parts is, is you're, you're basically literally sacrificing because you're going to be spending all your time on this, yet you're not going to really be making a ton of money. You're just not. It's just, you know, like, like I talked about Joe Rogan. It took him five years. He was doing another job at the same time. Even for me, I was, uh, you know, in the beginning when I started this, I was actually, I had that mission where I was like a, helping with ministry in Malaysia. I was helping with ministry in Malaysia. And because of that, you know, I was able to get, you know, uh, get support while I was here. And then on top of it, doing that. Do you know what I mean? So when I look at this, it's very, very similar, Right. So a lot of times in the beginning, you're not going to be able to survive on your own. And that's why I know that a ton of people will not go into full-time uh, social media. It's just, it's not easy. And you're not going to be able to survive that well doing full-time uh, internet ministry. And that's why it's going to be hard. That's why it's going to be hard is you're going to have, uh, like in Korea, they have like hundreds of channels, maybe even a thousand channels already going out. But how many of them are actually doing full-time? A lot of them are doing part-time. And because it's part-time, their growth is going to be part-time growth instead of full-time growth. You know what I mean? So that is something that I look at and say, yeah, uh, it's all going to be about the time you put in, the time and effort that you put in. And that's going to be something that we have to really... Uh, we have to recognize, right? So I would say like these are, these are a couple of things that uh, pieces of advice that I would give when it comes to uh, internet ministry and people going to social media and the things that people need to be aware of, right? But that's my process. I have my deadlines, right? I have my deadlines. And the reason why I put 2 p.m. 
is because when I was in Vancouver, right? When I was in Vancouver, Monday, 2.30 p.m. is the actual time that the podcast goes out, like in Asia. So it goes out 2.30 p.m. in Vancouver, which is Asia or Malaysia at 5.30 p.m., which means that if I don't get it uh, uploaded and scheduled by 2.30 p.m., then I'm going to be late. So that's where that time came from. And I just kind of keep it wherever I go. So and here I am in Taiwan, and uh, you know it's, uh, it's like 1 p.m.-ish, one, like yeah, a little bit over uh, after 1. And I'm recording now. I should be everything done by 2. Everything should be done by 2 p.m. So when I look at this, it's like, yeah, I'm kind of keeping the same schedule. And I like to keep that type of schedule. I wish I could work out more, uh, but I, I am not. But uh, very, very grateful, very thankful uh, for the question. And I hope it's something that can help you guys out there who are thinking about internet ministry. And if not doing it, you guys can help support internet ministry too. Like we talked about before, it's whether it's, you know, watching the videos, sharing it with your friends, supporting it financially. There's a tons of different things that you can do there too, praying for the channel also. And, you know, when I look at you guys out there, that's what you guys are doing. And I'm super grateful and thankful. Uh, this one last thing, I, I do want to talk about internet ministry that Sunseem talked about, okay? Sunseem in the past, you know what he said about these uh, YouTube channels and having followers? Okay, like, you know, one thing, you know, right, uh, one thing everyone should recognize at this moment is internet ministry is, even though we are pretty much late to the show, Providence is in the baby stages of internet ministry. But it is the place we will grow the fastest. It's going to be through internet ministry. People can try and, and try to think about doing it word of mouth and evangelizing, you know, going out and finding people one by one. The future is internet ministry. It's going to be internet ministry. And uh, this is going to allow God's history to flourish. So it's like at the time of Paul. Why was Paul able to travel the entire world three times, well, at least the Roman Empire three times over? And at that time, what was being built by the Romans were the roads. All roads lead to Rome. And because of these roads, it made it much easier for people to travel, you know, travel to this uh, to this city, to that city, and that became the one of the reasons why Paul was able to travel all over the world. At the time of Martin Luther, what happened? At the time of Martin Luther, it was the printing press. So he was able to post a 95 thesis. It was put onto a printing press, and it was already spreading all over Europe at that time. Right, And when it was spreading all over Europe, people, it, it was just spreading so quickly that the gospel could be spread because it could be copied through the printing press. Now, today, what is the new printing press? It's the internet. The internet is the new printing press. It allows the word to spread at lightning speeds where you can even do it live and people can watch it in real time. That's how crazy it is, right? So think about this. What Sunseep said in the past is that if you have a channel and you have a thousand followers on your channel, he said you are pastoring a thousand man church. Think about that. You are pastoring a thousand man church. So think about this. My YouTube is 5,300 subscribers. And if you think about that, 5,300 subscribers, if I have a 5,300 person church, this is the largest church in Providence. I'm gaining about 100 to 150 new subscribers per month, which would also make it the fastest growing church in Providence. Do you know what I mean? Like that's, that's how you have to kind of look at, this is the way some seem sees it, right? If I have a channel of 100,000, you probably will have the largest church in all of Providence for a long time, right? So when you think about it this way, yeah, we are running churches through internet ministry. It's not a small thing. Sunseem sees it as a big thing, even though it's not big right now. What does that mean? Like no one really has an established uh, channel. Uh, very few people do. And when it comes to religious channels, very few, few people have that also. So when you look at this, like, oh, this is how Sunseem, this is how the heavens are looking at internet ministry in this way also. So when I saw this, I was like, yeah, this makes a lot more sense. It really does. So I hope it's something that you guys can take a look at and think about too, that this is... This is like the future. It really is. Right? So, uh, 
So uh, that's something I, I do think that we have to take into consideration. And I hope it's something that all of us will really be able to recognize also. Okay. Uh, today, I have a brand new poll. Is how many times have you been to Korea or visited Won Myung Dong? Now, why I put down how many times have you visited Korea and visited Won Myung Dong is because I don't mean that you went to uh, Korea for, for five days and you went to Korea f- and you went to Won Myung Dong five days in a row. So you've been to Won Myung Dong five times. No, no. I meant that like every time, how many times have you traveled to Korea to go to Won Myung Dong? Right? So, you know, for me, I, I've gone over 10 times to Korea and visited Won Myung Dong. So for you guys, I'm just curious how many people have gone to, how many times people have actually gone to Korea to go visit Won Myung Dong, right? Each trip, not the five days, five days in a row, that means five times to Won Myung Dong. How many trips have you taken to Won Myung Dong? Meaning you took, a, you took a flight to Korea, you visited Won Myung Dong, maybe five, four or five days, and then you came back and that's one trip, okay? So uh, very interesting. I want to see how many times you have visited Korea. And it's going to be quite interesting because I know that there's a lot of new members that are listening to this channel also. So go ahead and write that uh, in below. Okay. So there it is, guys. That is uh, today's first segment. Hope you guys enjoyed this part of it. I, uh, I thoroughly enjoy just talking. <laughs> this is my passion. My passion is to talk, right? So uh, yeah. If you got, Oh, and guess what, guys? I do think we, we are going to start doing... Um, special guest podcast. Remember I talked to you before that, yeah, it'd be good to have other people doing a full podcast for the entire day kind of thing. And I think it might start from next week. I'll kind of give you a heads up that uh, I'll tell you later who that person might be, but uh, definitely going to be quite exciting because I think that is, uh, it's good to have more people getting involved, realizing what it takes to do it. And then people can start doing things on their own too. And I think that would be a big benefit to have more and more people out there in the world doing these podcasts and stuff too. Okay, so there it is, guys. That is the end of segment one. Uh, We do have uh, the practical word study after this. Uh, But before that, let's get into the first music break of the day. 2023, we've all come a long way. Many different stories, but we're all on the same journey. Many, many ups and downs, but we're all still around. Many, many, many lessons, but each one came with a blessing. Let's not forget for where we come from when we make this confession. Some people just want to watch the world burn. As for you and I, let's set ourselves on fire. Shine a light so bright that will make the people say, Burning life, burning life. Uh Uh-huh. Look at the flames in my eyes. Watch it burn, but don't stare too long. You might lose your sight. Some people gunning for a devil, but they'll never see our demise. Burning life, burning life. Who's the one? I'm the one. He's the one. Are you the one? No, we're the ones. We're the ones who keep the fire going till the day we die. Till they see the light, make it bright. Till we hear the people say, Born sinner, never could be ill. I know I'm back from the dead. Yeah, the Lord is my healer. I took the red pill. That's why I call him teacher. When you learn about the spirit, oh, there ain't nothing realer. The one you learn from determines your entire destiny. Learn from the one who taught about eternity. Cloud craving, paper chasing. The joy is only temporary. I don't wanna do the same thing. Things are hard to count the vanity I keep my eyes on the prize I'll never sell my soul to the devil in disguise With both hands on each side I'm holding on to dear life I keep my guard up, never back down When it goes down, I call on the Christ Spiritual battle, answer the call It's Call of Duty, modern warfare Put the armor of God The fighting Lucy with the rock I got atomic bombs Love the Lord your God And all your brothers Watch the demons fall Don't be deceived Know who the ups is Keep the unity and peace Go far way across this Came to preach the word of God Like I'm born in Tarsus Here to testify the things I've seen on road to Damascus He's the real deal, the real thing Be glad you heard the king's speech Blessed are those who reach the end And get to hear the Lord speak G.O.D.'s, P.O.C. We fulfilled every Everything, burning life, kerosene, burning life, legacy. You will never see me stop in the future. The life that fulfills God's will will continue. Everyone thinks I'm unfortunate because I go through suffering. But inside of me it's different. Because I walk the path of eternal life. Burning life, burning life, uh huh. Look at the flames in my eyes, watch it burn, but don't stare too long, you might lose your sight. Some people gunning for a devil, but they'll never see our demise, burning life, burning life. Who's the one? I'm the one, he's the one, are you the one? No, we're the ones, we're the ones who keep the fire going till the day we die, till they see the light, make it bright, till we hear the people say, Like 
Mary poured out her perfume on Jesus' feet. I must pour out my heart, mind, and love on the one who saved me. All right, so let's get into uh, our second segment, which is the word study. And every Tuesday, we do have the practical word study. And I think the big topic that everyone is kind of getting them, like thinking about right now, is a new direction when it comes to evangelism. And the evangelism is talking about two different, two distinct type of people, which is either second generation Christians or uh, Gentiles. Okay, so we need to understand what it means first is what type of people are we actually trying to evangelize, all right? Actually, well, before we get into this, the first thing I want you guys to know is this is, um, even though it's like, oh my gosh, new direction came out, we're gonna be evangelizing this type of person, oh, Gentiles, second, second generation Christians, what does this all mean kind of thing, right? If you really think about it, guys, we've already been doing this. It's not like we've been focused only on Christians. We have been evangelizing Gentiles already. It's not like we, we've, you know, we, we've, go look at your church. Look in your church just to see how many people came from the former faith. And guess what? Most likely, you're going to see maybe half, maybe half, right? You're not going to see a ton of people coming from the former faith. Like, just, just go to your church, go to your church, tell, you know, ask everyone, hey, who's from the former faith? Put their hands up. You're not going to see a large number. Like, you're going to see people, but it's not going to be uh, like that, right? So uh, that's the first thing that we need to know is we're, we, we're already doing this. So don't like go, hey, I don't understand what this means. I don't understand this. We've already been doing it. This is not really that new to us. It's just now more official, like official change, Right? So when you look at a Gentile, what is a Gentile? A Gentile can be anyone who doesn't believe. It could be an atheist. It can be agnostic. It can be someone who um, could be another religion. It's just an atheist. Uh, not an atheist. A Gentile. Someone who's not from, uh, like, say, Christianity. Someone who's not from the Bible. Right? So I don't know if that would... Con if Would you consider... Would we consider Jews to be a Gentile? And I don't think so, right? Because, well, guys, if we want to take this like literal, like a Gentile in a literal sense, a Gentile, the actual literal meaning is someone who is not Jewish. Yeah. So we can't really say we're kind of Gentiles too because we're not Jewish either. You know what I mean? So uh, it's, it's someone who is non-Jewish, non-Hebrew, okay? Now, if we were to take the definition from our perspective as people in this history, it would be anyone who is non-former faith, yeah? So, you know, in the past, a Christian, uh, yeah, it would be something that is non-Jewish at that time, which would include Christians. And now at our time, because it's about the new history, we're including people who are non-Christian. It basically includes everyone who is non-Christian. Okay? Anyone, anyone's, and it would be a little bit different. I would, I would even say you can count people that used to be Christian but are not Christian anymore. And that would still be considered a Gentile because they don't believe. They're not Christian. They don't deem themselves a Christian anymore. They may know some parts of the Bible and stuff, but consider that large group of people is people outside of Christianity. Okay? So when you think about it, how many of us have been evangelizing Christians and non-Christians? We've done both. So please, everyone, don't freak out. It's kind of something we've all, we've all experienced, right? Like we've all experienced evangelizing these types of people too. So I don't think it's something you'd be like, oh, I don't understand. And the answer is you understand. Unless you've never evangelized before or unless you have only focused 100% on Christians and Christians only, uh, then you'd be like, oh, I don't know what to do. But I think that anyone who's evangelized has evangelized all types of people, Christian and non-Christian, Okay. Now, the one that I think that we have to do think about is this second-gen Christianity. And the way that Sunstein put it is uh, people not from the, like, that are not from the establishment, okay? And this is something we've been doing also, too. 
So this is not something we're going to freak out about. It's not something we're going to say, oh, I don't know, I don't understand this. People from the establishment are those that cannot change their perception. They cannot change their perspective. They, are, they cannot change their nature of what they believed in the past. And they just live the way that they've always been living. Okay? So when you understand this, it's like, oh, okay, so they are Christian, but they're open-minded. They're not stuck on a certain way that they believe. And you're going to find that a lot of times you're going to meet Christians and non-Christians, and when you meet them, what's going to happen? You're going to be like, oh, this person's a lot more open-minded. Guess what? We've already been doing this. Okay? So second-gen Christianity, you have to look at it like Joshua. In the Old Testament time, you had Moses' generation, and they were very stuck on the law. They had very harsh, strong perceptions. They're like, oh, how could Moses marry this, this non-Jewish or this non-Hebrew Zipporah from Midian? Oh, and they, they would say bad things about him, but not understanding that he's coming from, you know, he is the man of God that was sent, right? He's the, the man of mission. Right? You'll have these people that keep going against the man of mission. Their perceptions, are, their perspectives are so fixed and hardened that it took them all dying off. And God waited for the second generation, which is Joshua's generation. Uh, they were a lot more open. Their minds and hearts were a lot, uh, were thinking about only about what God wants. And because of that, uh, he was able to take this second generation of Joshua and the Israelites into the land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey, the land that was promised to them, right? So when you look at this, you're like, oh, okay, so that's what like a second generation Christian is. So when you kind of listen to these definitions, I don't think anyone should be freaking out or anyone should be like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. And the answer is you already know what to do. If you're someone who's evangelized already, you already know what to do. You probably do, right? So... Uh, I would say that this, this, this would be the two different def definitions that we look at, okay? So I would also say is when we do go evangelize, one of the strategies we do use is direct Bible study. Correct, right? And direct Bible study is not going to be something that is, uh, that is attracting Gentiles, people who are non-Christian and they don't want to read the Bible or whatever it is, right? It's true. The Bible studies is actually more towards the open-minded second-generation Christians. So we are opening our, like, we have a big major focus on these open-minded Christians, which is not a very, very large group of people. Which means that what are we going to do to attract the people who are Gentile Gentiles, who don't want to just do Bible study, Right? And one of the things that Sunseem said is, and, and one of the things that Sunseem talked about in the past that we should think about also when it comes to discussion of evangelism of Gentiles, like one thing Sunseem said was, uh, one of the reasons why Jesus was healing people and Jesus was feeding the poor, healing the sick, solving their problems is because as long as that big problem is there, they can't listen to the word properly. So what does Jesus do? Because hunger is their biggest thing, he will feed them first so they have that major thing that is taken care of and then after that gives them the word so that they can listen properly so one of the things that Sunsim talks about is we have to solve people's problems and this is a very general statement but there's a lot of times that we're able to solve people's problems how let me give you a few examples of solving people's problems we can give them the word of course not in a religious manner like hey the bible says this my pastor says this no we actually share the contents of the word so that people know that oh this is a way that you can fix your problems and then when they put it into action they're going to be able to solve their issues another way of doing it is people giving testimony hey I was going through this, and I was going through this. However, I prayed. However, I put the words of God into action, and this is what actually happened, right? Or they may not talk about God first, but they'll say like, yeah, I did this, this, and this, and it actually worked. And then later on, they'll say, hey, I learned this from church. I learned this from the Bible. That's, that's where I got my answers from, and this is how it was solved for me kind of thing, right? So, there's two different ways even right there how we can still use the word. We can still testify about prayer. We can testify about these things, right? And be able to show people, yes, this is what it's actually about kind of thing, right? So that is something that I do think we can uh, really think about deeply, properly, and understand that, yeah, this is what's going, this is what, how we have to really uh, 
take into consideration all the things uh, that all the things that uh, you know the different things that we've received already through the words and stuff like that too. So I would say that we can do this through social media. We can do this through internet ministry. We can do this through like events we have at church when we meet people at a coffee shop. These are, these are all the different ways that we've been doing it anyways, right? So we share the word, share answers to solve things in life, giving testimony how, how God has helped us or how prayer has helped us about this or that. And there are going to be endless opportunities, And the only thing that we need to figure out is what is the best method that we can do it. The content and stuff, people can, you know, if if people have been evangelizing anyways, the content is not the issue. The issue is going to be the how, what type of event, what type of social media. Like these are the types of things where people will be like, oh, that's the hard part. How do I disseminate this type of information to people out there in the world in a better way, in a proper way and stuff like that too, okay? So that's kind of the thing that I would look at and say, hey guys, this is something that you guys should be thinking about. And um, the the evangelism that Sunsim talks about, yes, we now have an official direction, which means our focus should be more towards that. And we just need to think about how are we going to send this message out to the world. And uh, I'll tell you time and time again, it's going to always be about uh, internet ministry. I think that's going to be the biggest way to do it. And uh, as, I, I, as I also shared about that, that, uh, that doctor that gave that testimony, as my friend from Korea called me and said, hey, you got to listen to this because he's talking about internet ministry, right? And that's going to be the way where we can uh, fulfill Sunsteam's dream of preaching to a million people, right? A million people. That's not going to happen through all of us reaching out and finding one person each because if we're at around 50,000, it means that people have to bring 20 people each, which is pretty crazy. Is it 20? Wait, 10 would be 500,000. Yeah, 20 people each. Everyone would have to bring 20 people each, which basically means that we need to meet... uh, we probably have to meet like 2,000 people each to get those 20 people kind of thing, right? And that's not easy. We need to, the, the best way right now is through the internet, for sure, for sure, okay? So yeah, that's kind of one of the, the, big, the big topics that is coming out, and I hope it's something that people can discuss. People can talk about it in the comment section. What are people doing for this or that? But ultimately, we kind of already have been doing it, and it's just a matter of us finding the best medium or the best platform for us to get that message out where people actually want to listen, okay? So there it is, guys. That is today's Practical Word Study. Hope it's something that you guys have enjoyed. Uh, if you have any other questions or things like that, please let me know because there's a lot of things for us to talk about anyways when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to internet ministry or ministry itself inside your churches and such too. Okay? So uh, yeah, that's the end of Practical Word Study. Before we get into Pravi and the media today, let's get into the last music break of the day. <laughs> Just calling your name I want to wonder who 
Just open up your eyes He's waiting for you too He's not a man in disguise And the heart is crossed to bear But your heart's not what I wear To think this effort and this love Could overcome the dirty stairs And it's all because of you Yeah, it's all because of you Said it's all because of you Yeah, I need you Up your heart and say, I believe in what you say, and I promise you will gain much more. Yeah, we're looking for the lost ones. I was a lost one. I found the right one. I found the right one. Yes, you right now. Yes, you right now. Yeah, we're looking for the lost ones. I was a lost one. I found the right one. I found the right one. Okay, so let's get into our final segment for today. And today's final segment uh, is Pravi in the media. At the moment, guys, uh, we know that the second trial for KJS and the six, uh, the six executives, the appeals has finished. And, uh, you know, KJS, her seven-year sentence was upheld, including the second person. Uh, but two of them were released, and we know where that came from, too, in the spiritual condition that was set before that. Uh, the only thing remaining is two more, they say, two more trials left, one in June and one in July. And then they'll give the final sentencing for Sun Sanim's, uh, uh appeals trial. And I'm pretty sure that even if we win, it's going to go straight to the Supreme Court again. But uh, that's just... Uh, there's not a lot going on right now. The only, like I talked about last week, the issue was about the copying of the files. Uh, well, this week, there's more of, like, there's these um, articles out right now, and it has to do with, uh, let me just bring this up here. It has to do with, there's an accusation by KDH and, uh, and the producer of the I Am God season two, and the accusation they're making is that there is a police officer, and they say they actually have a list of 20 police officers in Providence, right? So interestingly enough, interestingly enough, uh, there's like, oh, we have a list of 20 police officers in, in Providence. And I'd be like, well, in Christianity, you're probably going to have a list of like 2 million people who are police officers in Christianity. Do you know what I mean? Like, even when it came down to um, the Catholic Church being accused, there's, like, there's no one sitting there saying, oh my gosh, there's two million Catholics that are police officers, and many of the, the police officers working on this trial are, are Catholic too. Maybe they're uh, going against it, right? So the, 20, the list of 20 people who are police officers in Providence is not a big deal, Okay. But the accusation they're making is, is that one of the police officers is uh, someone who actually destroyed evidence, okay? And they don't actually have any evidence of this officer destroying evidence. The only evidence they have, which they have not shown, is they, they say they have a picture of this police officer bowing on his knees in front of Sun Sanim. Bowing on his knees in front of Sunsim. Okay? So that's the picture they say they have, which is kind of interesting that you wouldn't show it because I looked at all the different um, articles and no one shows this picture. Okay? So apparently they have evidence, photo evidence, not of him destroying evidence, but the of him on his knees in front of Sunsim. Okay? So that is not evidence against him destroying, destroying anything. Destroying evidence, right? It's just saying that they have a picture of this and they're insinuating that because he's in front, he's on his knees, that he'll do whatever Sunseam says or do anything to protect Sunseam kind of thing, right? So that is kind of the strategy that is being worked on right now. And I would say if I were to, to do a mental exercise, I've already done some of it with you already. 
The mental exercise I would do is, number one, is they have a list of 20 police officers and I'd be like, well, so do other religions. Other religions that are even bigger than Providence have even more police officers, more judges, right? More people who are on the Supreme Court, district courts or whatever it is, right? They have a ton of people on it, right? Not just in Providence. Every religion has people at all levels in society, okay? So for me is, that, that kind of means nothing. Second thing they said is, well, here's the accusation that he destroyed evidence. So the accusation of, of destroying evidence, the only real evidence that would actually prove it is if they have evidence that proves he actually destroyed evidence. The only evidence they're showing right now is that they, uh, they say they have a picture of this police officer on his knees, bowing before a sun's name, Okay. And even if it was true, the one thing we don't have is, is context. Remember, we're trying to prove guilt or innocence. We can't do it through something that is uh, not for sure. Or at least like, whoa, yeah, this is really bad. Like it shows him setting the hard drive on fire. That would be different. But even then, you'd be like, well, which hard drive is it? Is it really the hard drive that contains this evidence? Can you prove it? right? But if we just have a picture of him on his knees, let me give you some examples in Korea, maybe in Asian countries. What if it's Chuseok? What if it's the, the harvest festival where people bow before their elders and then they even get on their knees and put their foreheads on their hands, right? What if it's that? What if it's New Year's? What if it's the Lunar New Year where the exact same thing happens, where you go to your elders, the people that you respect, like the father figures or whatnot, and you bow down before them and you get their blessing? Like there's multiple reasons why someone can be on their knees. There's multiple reasons. Um, there's multiple reasons for many things to happen, but the burden of proof is on the person that accuses. So you have to really prove it. So when you think about it, what, they're, what I see, this is my personal opinion, this is just a personal opinion is, it's just trying to rile up public opinion against Providence. Because I think from what I see, my personal opinion is, things aren't really going that well for the accusers. Because especially one of the big ones is, uh, they're allowing the copying of files so then they can get a real forensics done on that file. Right, And once they get that real forensics done, then you can prove and disprove whether that file is real or not. So it looks like, it looks like from my humble opinion, and I'm gonna t I can take this back if I'm wrong, that, hey, you know, this looks like um, a way to, to, to garner public opinion because there is nothing that comes from this. Like even the evidence doesn't show, it doesn't even show, a, like it might give you motive, like, hey, there's a motive to, to help Sun Seam out. However, there's nothing proven there, right? It's just showing that there's a possible motive. And we don't even know the context of where, the, if the, we don't even know if the picture is real, which means eventually when that picture is submitted, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get forensics to check on it. And the forensics will tell us whether it is true or false. That's going to be the reality, right? So I would say whenever we hear these types of things and you hear things, people say, oh, we heard there's a list of 20 people. Guess what? There's like millions of people in the Catholic church. You go to any Catholic church, right? Uh, or any parish, you're going to find like hundreds of uh, of their people in the church that are going to be police officers, right? Doesn't prove anything. Oh, you know, he destroyed evidence. Then the only evidence I need to find out is where is your evidence that he destroyed stuff? I want to know that. Where's your evidence on the destruction of evidence? That's all I want to know. I don't care what he does in his personal time. I don't care what he does in his religion. And even that picture that you showed me, what's the context? Why was he doing this? And those are the things that come to my mind as a very reasonable and rational person, right? And this is something where I want you know, those of you guys, some of you, some of the listeners right now are non-members or people who are no longer in Providence, but they still listen to this podcast. And that's the thing I would, I would tell you guys is you guys may think about me and say, oh, you're just being biased. And the answer is I am biased in one sense that I believe in this history. I do. I really believe in this history. I believe 
uh, in Sansnim. I believe that he's innocent, right? Which means that I am not the one who is trying to accuse or say that he did something wrong. It's your side that's trying to accuse me or accuse Sunsim, sorry. So if your side is accusing, you need to have absolute proof. You cannot base your decisions or what you, th like just by a feeling or just because I know someone. It's, not enough, it's not, not enough evidence. Can you imagine if you were taken to, to court and then you were, uh, you were convicted guilty as a felon by the, by the standards you use to make someone to make someone seem guilty, personally, I think that's that would be uh, unfortunate. You would feel too much injustice at that time. So what I'm telling you guys is, if it's something this serious, you gotta have the evidence. You do, right? And it's not going to be based on, hey, uh, this is what someone told me. It cannot be based on that. All right. Either way, that's just a couple of things that are on my mind. Hope it's something that uh, you got. It makes you guys think a lot more deeply too. But uh, yeah, if you have any questions or anything else, just let me know. Would love to hear what you guys uh, are thinking about these subjects and stuff too. Okay. So there it is, guys. That is the uh, end of today's Tuesday podcast. Hope you guys really super enjoyed it just as much as I have. Have an amazing and awesome Tuesday, and we'll see you guys again tomorrow on the Morning Star Drive on one one seven point eight. It's the morning star drive on 17.8. You saw run up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly. So let's realign. Just listen and fill your mind. I'm burning with desire and the passion.